There we go. I think I got all my ducks lined up in a row. All right. Welcome, everyone. Good morning Welcome to Accuracy in America. I am Don Irvine once again, joined by Liz Matori. Hi. In a more, hi, in a more familiar location. Yeah, mom's <laughs> house, mom's house. Yeah. All right. We got a, we got a lot to talk about uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, just you know, the clock is uh, is ticking. 67 days until the election. That's it's amazing. I mean, as we as we go through this, it's going to be here in no time. Though, uh, as I always caution the uh, the viewers and the listeners, is that uh, 67 days until official election day, but mail-in voting, absentee voting, early voting, whatever, those things take place, uh, you know, much sooner. So uh, a lot of people have already cast their ballots well before November 3rd. Uh, so the campaign, you know, I mean, you know, there used to be a time when uh, people would campaign right, you know. It was a big deal campaigning up to November 3rd. They're going to continue doing it right up to Election Day, but there's going to be a, a certain chunk of that uh, electorate that will already voted, uh, and uh, you know their minds were made up. The base will make up their mind and probably vote early. The other undecided may wait more to the last minute. All right. Now, other thing is before we go on to other politics is uh, the hurricane now slash tropical storm Laura. I just wanted to mention this for a couple of minutes, and if you want to chime in on this, that's fine too. So this. Uh, these things are, you know, very destructive storm. I don't know, you know, if you've, you know, I have never lived through a hurricane really, uh, you know, and gone through a lot of these types of things. But, you know, when you, when you look at the categorization of how, how it's done, you know, category four, that's pretty severe. I mean, I think it only goes up to category five. So the winds get up to like 120, 150 miles an hour. You know, you can shelter in place, but if you're in the path of that storm, this is pretty tough. I mean, it you know it it's pretty devastating. Uh, though I did see at least that this seemed to be more of a wind event than a water event. Though the low lying areas, you know, Louisiana's got a lot of low lying areas, even as it gets up into that northern section. Uh, so it, it's still a very devastating type of a thing. But you know, the Gulf Coast areas, whether or not you're on the Louisiana side or the Texas side, they got hit pretty pretty hard. So far, I think I've seen the death toll was about 14, which I think is remarkably low for something like this. I think we're going to get the aftermath of this storm tomorrow, I think with a lot of rain. Uh, but, but thank goodness, thank God that uh, there wasn't more destruction and, and more deaths out of this. Absolutely. And un unfortunately, we're in the middle of the beginning of hurricane season. So we were just talking about whether in August, you know, we, we can see it at, through September and, and I don't know about October, but we do have to be prepared. And I think, you know, these are moments where I know this is a pivotal conversation, but you hope that this should be nonpartisan, you know, people can focus on what they need to do in order to stay safe and then, you know, and heal. Uh, but I, I pray, my big prayer is that obviously people are safe, but also that um, we are sort of neutral when it comes to the political um, angle of, um, you know, natural disasters. Yeah, no, very good point. And, you know, I, I really feel for anybody who has been in the path and has, has been affected one way or the other by this, because, you know, our country is already reeling from a global pandemic, and we're still struggling with a lot of things. We still have high unemployment and a lot of other issues. The economy is kind of just bumping along, but it's kind of, we're struggling. And, you know, to have a natural disaster on top of all that, you know, that can be very devastating. I mean, our, a lot of times the emotional state, the mental state of a lot of Americans is already getting pretty low. Yeah. This does not, this does not help the situation, but absolutely, this is not a partisan event or should not be a partisan event of any kind. We should mm -hmm. all be able to, you know, go just come together mm -hmm. and help those that need to be helped. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, moving on to politics because that's all it is <laughs> these days it seems we just had the conclusion last night of the republican national convention uh definitely a little bit you know i mean the both conventions were, were unorthodox by the fact that they were forced to go virtual so that was already one thing that was going to be a little bit strange and weird for for the conventions the other thing was is that uh the republicans you know donald trump president trump uh they used a white house backdrop uh, for not just Melania Trump and her, her speech the other night, but also for President Trump's uh, grand finale last night with fireworks on the mall. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much you watch of either convention. We haven't talked for a little bit. Of, I'd like to get your feel for 
what's going on here the last couple of weeks with both these conventions. Yeah, so of course the convention scene, if you will, is very dear to my heart. I participated in both the Democratic <laughs> Convention in 2012 and then fast forward 2016 in uh, Cleveland for the Republican. So, you know, I know a lot of people who are involved in particularly mostly the Democratic side still. And, you know, like a lot of effort um is put into the convention you know obviously we have friends who are delegates um this is a very important these these weeks are very important to our respective parties so there's a lot of you know business conducted it's not about all, like all the bells and whistles so my hope is that both delegates and uh, on both parties were able to get what they needed to do in reference to business but at the end of the day it is a show correct you know it is the one time where the people who aren't partisan hacks like we are <laughs> you know um see what the parties have to offer you know it's on primetime television it is you know a show to again showcase what your party offers to the i would say undecided it also rallies your base i'm sorry i tried tried to watch the democratic um convention i literally fell asleep like i felt so bad i was like eva longori for example i remember she was a very active um surrogate in 2012. um i remember you know her like being uh, pushed uh, you know you know through the tr um, the crowd while we're trying to sell t-shirts you know what i mean like <laughs> you know like i was like you know t-shirt girl right so um you know i was concerned that they haven't moved past the Hollywood elite. And again, like you hear that as a soundbite, but when you know the backstory to it, um, that's also the sort of the, the, the problem with the Democratic Party. I would say the Democratic Party establishment. They have forgotten the average citizen. That is the whole problem. So they didn't think of, oh, how does this come off? Like we're trying to engage these folks in the democratic side it was more like we're going to tell you what you need to know versus in the republican side it's like we respect the fact that this might be the only time you get to hear and see and witness this by the way the nba is not happening so you know, <laughs> you know people actually did watch they are curious and the republican party um you know kudos to their production team they actually pivoted and put in the effort to again showcase to the american people we want to work for your vote and that's sort of like beyond like the the fanfare because it was absolutely gorgeous i know the mellon auditorium very um well as a as a dc person to have an event there it is a showcase place for um the dc like locations um the white house sort of is like you know it was it was not the only way the Republican Party showed their honor to the to, to the electorate. Um, fireworks, gosh, when was the last time we as Americans were able to celebrate with fireworks? Don't forget, y'all canceled July 4th, people, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, the average citizen sitting there cooped up, you know, can't show their faces why not see some bit of humanity and experience that personal touch that they got from the republican party so those are that's my sort of observation of the two yeah that's good i mean i'm going to say this i feel a little bit triggered by being called a partisan hack by a conservative well i was i was <laughs> I, mean, I, I say that i say that in the loving way and when i, I know, said that i, I know like, i know i love it it's like are, i think that's the first time i've been called a partisan hack yeah. if you would even if you do air yeah. quotes by a conservative yeah. it's pretty funny to me well meaning like <laughs> We live and breathe but it's politics. True. <laughs> we live and breathe politics. You know, my statements are very partisan, and I've been thinking about that a lot over the last several months. Um, it traditionally is, you know, Republicans, Republicans, Democrats, Democrats, but the parties themselves have totally changed over the last four to eight years, All, both parties, and the electorate is not a part of either party. You know what I mean? There are more independent, we know that there are more independents than Republicans, sadly, <laughs> but the independent, the unaffiliated voter is the growing group because let's be honest, both parties 
I can be responsible for at least two years of the Republican Party, <laughs> two and a half, four. Um, we haven't done a good job of making sure they know that it's an open tent. And I'm hoping, you know, everyone, however you end up um, having a platform, whether it's you're running for office or you're in politics or you're in the media or you're even at the grocery store, you know, we, we, Americans are wondering who represents them. And we have to, we have to be the, you know, the ambassadors of our party and our values. Right. No, I mean, I think that's, that's good. I mean, the thing too is this is, I mean, the parties have changed, as you have said. And, you know, when I look at the DNC convention, I mean, you mentioned Ava Longoria, uh, that whole Hollywood thing that they tried to pull off was horrible. They, you know, oh, that song that they had. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I realize that the Democrats in Hollywood, they, they really are kind of, you know, joined at the hip. They're very close, but I, I, they, they, they didn't do a very good job this time around of using those Hollywood stars the right way or the way they could have. Now, Republicans, you know, had the advantage of going second so they could watch and they could see. And I think they did pivot and adjust a little bit. You know, I don't, I, none, none of us were really in the planning session so knowing what the, what the RNC was planning on doing before the DNC aired, you know, their convention. But the RNC then had a chance to say, oh, well, that didn't work. You know, maybe we were going to do that, but that didn't work. I will say, I will say that the DNC, the one thing that I thought was uh, that they did well was, was their roll call. Their roll call by presenting it with kind of the backdrop of the different states like they did oh, nice. was far better than the Republicans just kind of going through the lines and just doing the standard thing kind of thing that they did. Mm -hmm. So I give them that. But, but overall, uh, you know, it's kind of like what Van Jones said about the, about the Biden speech is in the, in the anticipation is that, you know, we're hoping that he doesn't kind of blow it basically yeah. so that, you know, they they had a low bar for, for Joe Biden at the beginning yeah. and he just had to achieve that low bar because they were on pins and needles. They were worried that he was going to screw up and they were going to go right into the toilet, you know, at that point in time, at, you know, at, at a point where they have, uh, theoretically at least by po by most polls you know a lead narrow or large depending upon what poll you look at uh you know and, and so you know he was kind of in the driver's seat so you know biden played it safe he gave what about a 14 right. minute speech he didn't he didn't set anybody on fire but he didn't you know he, the, the dnc to me they came out of that with to, to me if you look at it, it's like so what is their message beyond we don't like donald trump donald trump's a bad guy vote for me because donald trump's a bad guy well, again, like having just left the Democratic Party in 2014, 15, this is the issue that I had an issue with from the from the jump. You know, they did not invest and they still have not invested in the next generation of Democrat leaders. Kamala Harris is a whole nother conversation, but Tulsi Gabbard, you know, um, um, the lady from Minnesota, I'm, I'm blanking on her name now, but, you know, even uh, Klobuchar, exactly. Um, you know, these two, just those two women alone. Um, yeah, Buttigieg is a whole, again, a whole nother story. He's kind of skews progressive, but the people who have really been in the fight for at least 10 to 15 years, they literally push to the side through the primaries. Um, and then they're like, okay, well, we're gonna, you, they force fed, I mean, more, shoot. You thought that they force fed Hillary Clinton. This Joe Biden stuff is like, it, it, it was, I did not understand why they protected him so much over the last several months. Um, now I think they're sort of kicking themselves. I, I hope someone is regretting that decision because there are, as much as I, 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 I don't want to admit it, but there is the next generation of Democrat leadership before you even get to AOC that they are not supporting. And that is, again, the demise of that party, because if you're not building out that next generation, then you're stuck. And not only that, you are forcing registered Democrats, for example, to vote otherwise. It's, and so it's like, this is a problem that the Democratic Party created for themselves. Yeah, you know, the other thing too, and, and maybe I'm wrong about this, I mean, the, you know, 
part of this too is that you know, the, as I think you may have mentioned a little bit, you know, that these events also as a way to showcase their future stars. Yeah, yeah. And I know that they put a lot of people out there for the DNC, but I'm not sure that this time around that we saw the future of the Democratic National Party, the Democratic Party, with this. I don't know that any, I don't know if any of these people hit it out of the park. I mean, yeah. you know, I can think about Bill Clinton. I can think about Barack Obama, yeah. who, you know, when you, when you heard their speeches when they first came on the scene at the DNC, you're like, okay, good politician, good speaker, whatever. Yeah. You know, these guys have got a future, watch out. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure I came away from that at all. I'm still trying to think about, did anybody yeah. set themselves apart? I can't think that anybody did. No, because the future of the Democratic Party is a Republican nominee. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what happened. You know, and again, like, I'm, you know, we didn't get the fanfare of this year, but at the same time, it's like we already created that history. You know, that legacy, they created me. So at the end of the day, they're not doing anything to win me back personally, personally. Like I'm not going back to that hot mess. I don't want to, I don't need to, I don't desire to. On top of that, the Republican party, a party that I had no clue about quite frankly, has been welcoming, has helped me grow intellectually, spiritually. And yeah, they nominated me after two years of joining the, the, the party because they understood where I was coming from, you know? And this was, again, like, this is an issue that, again, both parties need to address. You shouldn't have to have, you know, a million Twitter followers in order to be nominated and supported by either party. AOC is included in that. When you put fame above, you know, a foundation, then, you're, you're again stuck with what you end up putting through um, you know, the, the process. Um, Rand Paul, for example, I'm sorry, he hasn't really been encouraged really to, to grow. Um, uh, Jordan, you know, there's so many people in the Republican side that are the next generation, well, next generation is a, it's a very broad term. <laughs> I mean, Sherry is out, is, is out of, pol you know, partisan politics, really. Um, Chafee, you know, I'm just thinking about the different people who, over the last four years, we're really missing that, their presence in the fight. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's interesting, too, because, I mean, I look at, you know, when I'm looking at the, the, the RNC speakers, too, I think, mm -hmm. You know, we had a, you had also the way the media covered these things. I mean, oh goodness, with, oh, my with, word. The, with the DNC convention, you know, with Michelle Obama's speech on the opening night, I mean, MSNBC was falling all over themselves to praise her. It was the one, one of those interesting things, though, was that, you know, AP had to call her out because she mentioned the kids in cages kind of a thing as trying to get at Trump. But AP had to point out, uh, which they pointed out before, is that, you know, that the picture of this came in 2014 when her husband was president right. as well as they weren't cages they were these chain link fence operations and things like this mm -hmm. and so she had misspoken on this but nobody except the ap called her out on that and yet it got very little play on that i saw the washington post did some they did some correction uh, fact checking on joe biden's speech mm -hmm. but i really didn't see that being picked up anywhere whereas uh, with the Republican National Convention, uh, CNN and a lot of, you know, and, and MSNBC, they were trying to do, you know, live, you know, fact checking, you know, unbelievable because they were ready, they, they were ready to pounce on, yeah. on all these things. But, you know, I, I think even the media had to, you know, a couple things is that they look at Tim Scott and they're like, okay, he gave a great speech. Okay, they got to admit that. Even CNN praised Melania Trump mm -hmm. because, you know, she, she did talk about, you know, kind of the, the, the equality issue, as well as the, you know, the COVID issue, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. And though Bette Midler, you know, came out and said, Oh, my gosh, you know, she still can't speak English, oh. for which she had to backtrack on because it's like, oh, look, you know, at that point in time, Bette Midler, you're not, you have now offended every immigrant yeah. <laughs> and son and daughter, of every immigrant, yeah. Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, whatever, when you say that, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm sorry. It's like, you know, my mother came from Japan. You know, my wife yeah. is from Korea. Right. You have, you have offended me right. on top of everything else that you always offend yeah. me for, but you've now doubled down. It was right. just kind of, it was just crazy to see that. And one of the things, you know, 
I, I learned something about this. I mean, Kaylee McEnany. Yeah, I, had, I didn't know about I that. had no idea about this bracket, yeah. you know, thing. I, this was, to, this shocked the heck out of me. Yeah. But what a great, you know, what a great way to go out there and personalize things. Yeah. And I, you know, I just, I don't know. When I, when I, when I look at the RNC, and I'm not trying to be partisan in this I'm sense, just, but, I'm, I'm, just but I'm, I'm just trying to look at it and say, look, there's some personal stories. This is real America. Mm-hmm. And, and I just didn't see, I didn't feel the same with the DNC this year. Yeah, well, it's again, do you care about the electorate or don't you? Um, that's, again, one of the main reasons why I love the Democratic Party. Push comes to shove they only govern over with rhetoric. You know, they want your vote, but they don't do anything the moment they get your vote. And then they say, oh, you can't be a Republican because they're all racist. Oh, but what happens when you really realize that most Republicans aren't racist? Well, therefore your one argument sort of falls to the wayside. Um, again, with all the, every, I can't even speak to one of the speakers because each one was like, oh my goodness, I'm crying. Oh my goodness, I'm crying. <laughs> like, you know, and, and this is such a, it, it, it is about emotions. Right. I mean, you wish that it's not, but let's be honest. I mean, part of it's partially about uh, emotions. But again, we also coupled that with the policies. Um, I'm talking about the remember the Chinese um, defector um, that was beaten for speaking up about the one one child policy. Um, he was uh, blind and he was talking in, with Braille, uh, reading in Braille. I'm like, come on, if you can't. You put, we basically were able to put faces to concepts um, that again, the average voter needs to know more about the truth. Like for example, Abby Johnson, you know, I have a connection with Abby Johnson and you know, most people haven't seen Unplanned. Some people have. You cannot hide that six minutes on a national primetime stage of the message of the truth about abortion. So those moments have now, again, entered at least a little bit in the conscience of the average citizen. That is what, that's what's effective. You know, we already know that Rachel Maddow is going to sort of like trying to destroy even someone like Melania Trump. But if that viewer heard and saw real time the speech they're now comparing their emotional connection they had with melania trump to the opinion of rachel maddow so once you start seeing how many attacks you know they the the left is throwing at these people that we were able to see in real time you now in your conscience gets to determine what is the truth do I believe my eyes when I when I see the truth about how sincere President Trump comes off? You know, I think I don't know if you want to talk about this now, but like his presentation la- last night was so crisp. The timing was like, man, oh man, it was just so. It was there was a little classic Trump in there when he was like, and you know, President Biden, you know, shook the hands of some of the service members and gave them kisses too. <laughs> like oh my gosh we know what he's talking about but again he he has a way about him that again when you ignore or just put aside a little bit of the negative coverage you see for yourself and you experience um that connection with the republican party the the speakers president trump as well yeah, I mean, and I think, yeah, I mean, the Republicans, I mean, when you're the, when you're the party in power, you have a little bit of advantage potentially. And President Trump is, he definitely knows how to take advantage of the things that he has there. You know, I'm not sure about the propriety of using the White House and all those things. I mean, he and, he and, the, and Vice President Pence are not subject to the Hatch Act. But, you know, just throwing out there, I, I don't think that the Democrats should be investigating that because I think that's that's not a campaign issue that anybody is going to, re- it's not going to resonate with anybody. Yeah. 
So I'm saying, why don't we investigate all of the, or the last several administrations and how they use the White House in reference to campaigning? Why don't we investigate if the Obama administration, you know, spied on the Republican nominee and, you know, president-elect from the White House? Let's put it all into perspective. You know what I mean? Right. No, I mean, and that's right. I mean, I think this is, I think that's one of and that's partisan one, yeah. means. Yeah, that, I think that's. I think what you're saying there is that's one of the dangers. If they go down that path, then it could be a Pandora's box for them of saying, "Okay, you want to focus on Trump and and what they did there, yeah. but let's go back and take a look back, you know, over the last you know eight, ten, twelve years, whatever, of other presidents and other things that have gone on behind the scenes that mm-hmm. may have also been Hatch Act violations that were not known. Do you want mm-hmm. to go there? No, I don't think you, anybody really wants to go there. Do we, do we as the public in general you know, understand that there's probably some of this going on? Yeah. Do I really care? And that, no. I mean, it's, some, it's hard to separate the campaign from the presidency sometimes when you're in that final few months and all that kind of stuff. So I don't really, I don't really think yeah. much about it. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things I'll be curious about with, the, with how the Republican says with Donald Trump did this, is that because President Trump has been so norm-breaking mm-hmm. throughout his administration, is that despite all the, you know, all the kerfuffle, all just the kind of the, the fight back, the, you know, the blowback from the Democrats and the media about this, is that you know, he may set a new standard where other presidents, you know, Democrat next time they come around, uh, may decide to do the same thing. I just want to, I just want to remind conservatives that should that be the case, should should the next Democrat president, and we will get one in time because it's history is going to move back and forth with us, that if they decide to do the similar type of events, we cannot complain. We should be able to say, okay, you know, Trump did it. He set the standard. That's where it goes. And don't complain about it. Though I don't think that, you know, Trump's showmanship is very unique. Right. You know, and that, and that way set aside that not every president can pull this off. I was listening today uh, on a podcast that just happened to pop up, the Reagan Library sends these out once a week or whatever. But uh, on this week's, they actually replayed the 1992 uh, Republican convention speech by oh. Ronald Reagan in Houston. Mm-hmm. Terrific speech. One, you know, he he was he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 1994. So th- there was not a lot of lot more Reagan we got after that convention before mm-hmm. he wrote his Alzheimer letter and and withdrew from public life. But, you know, it just reminded me, that's another guy that could have pulled it off, right? right. That type of a thing. Uh, but, you know, I will say, I mean, my, my issue with Trump really is the fact that I think his speech, you know, he could have done this in 30, 35 minutes and been ex- even more effective because he tends to go to me a little bit too long with a lot of stuff. He, mm-hmm. There's periods in there where we don't really need stuff and he could have tighter speech. I wanted, I wanted a, for me, going in, and I had said this last week on Dr. Politics show with Dwight and Mark and the others, mm-hmm. and came, actually, I don't remember who was on the show last week, keep, the, the, the cast keeps changing, but the, uh, I had said that, you know, I, I wanted a more Reagan-esque type of speech, given that it's Donald Trump speaking, but one that, one that really kind of sets soaring type, you know, things and, and really gets you going off and kind of puts the campaign in a different mode. I don't know that I really saw that last night. I know that you, you know, you, you really liked it, which is great. And I, the base will love it. Okay, the yeah. base loves it no matter what. But what was interesting is that uh, on Fox and Friends this morning, Fox and Friends first, I guess it was even this morning, uh, Lee Carter, who comes on occasionally, and she does uh, these. Uh, they they look at these speeches and then they grade them. They they basically oh, have yeah. they have Republican, Democrat, Independent, and they they have a chart that goes as people are speaking and you know, the whole kind of thing like this. So Trump speech, every aspect of the Trump speech they analyzed from for the Republicans, none of it got an A. They got a B plus. Now the Democrats have been given Republicans Fs throughout the entire <laughs> convention. Shows they had you know they were going to give an F even before that first word was uttered, right? Yeah. So I'm not surprised with that. But he fell a little bit below the mark, you know, when they were doing their research on this. You know, nothing earth shattering. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't hurt him. And I think in the end, by going last, I mean, when I listened to the 538 Politics podcast, even the 538 people who are New York Times based people, right? They they work for the New York Times and other affiliates like that. 
their prediction was uh, that after the last night that Trump still gets a bump. Biden got no bump. I was surprised that, you know, I, I would be surprised that anybody really gets a bump because of a virtual convention. It's a little bit different. We look, you know, we don't have the pomp and circumstance. Uh, but the Republicans did a pretty good job of trying to recreate some energy. You know, Trump, when he interrupted the roll call and he was there and there were the delegates there and stuff like that, you know, they're going like, you know, yeah, it'll irritate them if, I, if we give them 12 more years. And the delegates are like 12 more years, 12 more years. So, you know, this is stuff that's great, that, that, that sets Trump apart from others. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, now we're going to get down to the down and dirty. But if I, I, think, I still think if I were, I'm, on, I'm the Democrats and the Biden people, I'm still a little bit concerned about my candidate and what's going to happen come November 3rd, you know, that evening, are we going to learn the results and is my guy going to win or is right. Trump going to, is Trump going to sneak through again? Right. So again, like so many things were going on over the last two weeks. Um, if you know, obviously Kamala, um, I think they did two speeches yesterday and, uh, and Biden did one. Um, usually they don't come out you sort of respect that party and you allow that party to sort of have their four days. Friday, you'd probably come out and say something to counter the rest of the week. But for them to come out on Thursday morning, the morning of the president's acceptance speech, again, like they know they're losing, which is, again, I'm so, I, it, it, I'm almost sad about it, <laughs> you know, but um, they know that they, that they, that they, dropped this one. Um, talk about optics, even Friday, I'm sorry, even um, Thursday night's um, um, speech, the White House is one thing, which I thought looked amazingly gorgeous in that, in the way that they set it up with all those, um, you know, American flags, it was beautiful. But what was most important was panning to the audience. There were 1,500, uh, that was kind of a lot, but 1,500 participants, attendees in the South Lawn. That really says we are here together. We are coming together to celebrate our country. We are in this together. You know, again, these are things that are subliminal. Um, an empty studio feels empty. You can't fill it. That's why they use the Mellon Auditorium. But if you have the president, speaking to 1500 supporters but they're still americans they're still humans there's still this this um understanding that um there's meat on these bones um again this is it's going to be interesting to see because i'm not an independent anymore what what independents are thinking what you know, um, moderate Democrats are thinking because they have been pushed out of the current Democratic Party. That that's a problem, and and the Democratic Party absolutely has had this problem for the last eight years. Yeah, you know, so so we have a couple of things in here. Right, one is that it's amazing to see that many people on the South Lawn. The, yeah. Uh, now it did create a media freakout, as did Mike Pence's speech at Fort McHenry because. Yeah there were no masks, you know, there are people that were kind of close together and no mask and the media just completely freaked out. You know, does that, does that hurt the campaign in any way, shape or form that, you know, they were, they didn't have the people there that were more spread apart and they didn't have them wearing masks, you know, at that point in time, does that, do you, did, did that bother you? No, what bothers me is that Saul, they're messing up Saul Linsky's, you know, rules. Saul Linsky said, don't use a tactic for lo too long because people get tired of it. I'm sorry, <laughs> people are tired of it. You know, yes, there's a health issue, but wearing those masks that don't do anything, we literally physically to stop any sort of virus, none of those, I just took it out of my pocket and I wore it five hours ago, or maybe yesterday, masks are doing anything. What they are doing is again, making people sort of bully others in, in, in forcing them to wear masks. Two, they do censor people. Three, they literally are covering communication visual communication, most of it comes from your mouth, not even thinking about your words, but how are you expressing those words? Um, and people and people want to breathe. 
you know, so the most, most people don't like wearing masks. <laughs> so, so I think um, it's not going to be as detrimental. The people who are going to have an issue with it are already staunch Democrats or staunch progressives. I don't think we're going to lose any support from people who like to breathe. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No. Well, you know, and, and here's the other thing. So I, I noticed that when I get up in the morning, I see uh, so a lot of things that are in my Twitter feed at the top mm -hmm. are Joe Biden tweets. Mm. So a lot of the tweets that he issued during the convention speeches and stuff like this. But there's a recurring theme that I see with all this during the entire four days, which is just, you know, he's harping on the virus cases, you know, the number of deaths. Uh, he talked, I think he tweeted yesterday about, uh, about Trump talking about the violence in the cities. You know, it, uh, you know, because you know, he, he, you know, he went after Biden and Biden's, you know, what Biden's America would be versus his America would be, right? There's a lot of law and order, you know, in what Trump and Pence are trying to do here, which I think is a good idea considering what's going on around the country. But I keep saying, you know, Biden, you know, he he puts these tweets out, but it's like, remember. Who is running those cities where the violence is occurring? I mean, yeah. these are not Repub conservative Republican heirs. They're, they're liberal mayors, liberal governors in most of these places. And, and they have sat back on their hands and just let the protesters go. You know, I mean, we had that crazy, cra another crazy, crazy thing with the CNN reporter. Uh, he, he's out there, you know, in Kenosha, mm -hmm. and he's talking about, you know, most of peaceful forces. Now, he was trying to say during the day they were peaceful, nighttime things were changing. Uh, but as that, but the Chiron for CNN was like, you know, mostly peaceful protests, you know, in, in, in Kenosha. And he's standing and there's buildings burning in the background. And, and you're like, you know, there, there, this disconnect with right. the, with the de you know, with the media and what's going on in real life is right. unbelievable. Well, again, it's again, we've, we know about it. It's a tactic that media and politicians use all the time. If you don't talk about it, if you don't cover it, you can act like it doesn't exist. That's a tactic, right? Um, but it does. And people have their own eyes. <laughs> to see for themselves. Um, I was downtown um, yesterday. Um, I went with a couple of my friends. We were on 14th and then we wanted to see the fireworks. So we were like trying to like hustle over, but we couldn't see it because of all the government buildings or whatever. But um, we ended up being like on the street when it was like at the, at the end. So people were in the, in the streets. Um, I didn't, I sort of felt uncomfortable because most of these gatherings don't happen at night actually one of the elders that i was standing with i was like oh you know they are sort of they're protesting he's like protests don't happen at night he's like civil rights protests never happen at night because once it gets dark it shifts the cadence shifts automatically in darkness and so even if they're let's say 75 percent of people who are peacefully protesting that energy and that element in a crowd, I think there were like maybe 200 people. I was between that and, and the Willard Hotel. So it was like sort of that intersection. Um, if one thing were to happen, all bets are off. So that's DC, that's a federal city. We have, you know, 50 cops in one block. So it's like, you know, a very, you know, big presence with the law enforcement. But for the smaller cities and for cities that, are encouraging this lawlessness and really this apocalyptic energy this is what they want they want people to get riled up they want the again the negative energies to boil up um but the cooler heads are the things the people that should prevail you know that is it's a it's it's really again backfiring their tactic is backfiring on them and they should not do it <laughs> right I'm, and we're going to pivot here in a second but i want to say one more thing on that yeah. which was just that you know after you know after all of the uh the things happened on the white house i mean senator paul Rand paul yeah was they tried the protesters tried to attack him i mean the yeah. cops had to you know kind of go around and protect him and he was very thankful for that yeah. uh but but that shows i think that also goes to your point i mean that backfires i mean wait a minute you're going to you're going to go after us senator you're going to take it out on that i mean it's not only that he's the most civil liberties 
senator probably of all time. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like he's the one who's pushed criminal justice reform for, since he's been in office. He's pushing the Breonna Taylor. He does not want no knock warrants. Like he's your guy, folks. Again, that's when they like the people who have some semblance of taking several step back. This is where you need to see this is the hot mess that we're talking about. This is the lawlessness that we're talking about. It's not racial. It literally is an energy that is being manipulated, especially if they can't even identify or have the wherewithal to know that Senator Paul is like your guy. It's ridiculous. All right. I want to go on to something because I do want to get your feedback from the, for something that is happening uh, as we speak right now in DC. So this is the, yeah. The, a march. It's been 57 years since Dr. Martin Luther King was in D.C. and gave mm -hmm. his gave his great oratory. But mm -hmm. the speech is called uh, the uh, the march is called the Commitment March. Get your knee off our neck march, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's going on uh, basically until about three or four o'clock this afternoon. Mm -hmm. But I I saw before I came on the show somebody had tweeted this thing out and uh, they already had some speakers. And you know I don't know most of these people, but there was a woman. Shawnee Benton Gibson, I think is her oh. name. And so she, her thing was all about, uh, she was, she was talking about, you know, black women and Latinx women and, and, and having kids and stuff like this. But here, mm -hmm. her big thing was black wombs matter. Okay. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, okay. And, and it was a big rant about this, you know, about all of this is that, and, and I don't know. I mean, I guess there are going to be people who support all of this stuff. But I wonder, you know, with the uh, with the things that, you know, what Dr. Martin Luther King tried to set forth mm -hmm. and what he was trying to say 57 yeah. years ago yeah. versus this. I mean, mm -hmm. is is that where the civil rights movement is going? Is this something that even should be attached to the civil rights movement at this yeah. point in time? Yeah, exactly. Um, 57 years ago and now is is it's it's the we're living their worst nightmare um you're talking about the whole idea of you know reproductive justice that's what they're trying to talk about how women black women need to be able to um have the choice especially if they can't afford to raise children or they don't want to have any more or what have you they should have the right to you know decide what goes on in their womb that's sort of where they're coming from however dr king would not be for abortion. That is the whole problem with Christian leadership, for example. There are pastors now that are encouraging their members to have abortions. That is wrong in the eyes of God, especially if you're coming from the religious front. When you're talking about the scientific aspect, I'm sorry, science exists, but it, it stops existing from, you know, gestation age of day one to, you know, week 40. Like, I don't understand. Um, and the average citizen doesn't understand anymore because it doesn't make sense. So what happens with the March on Washington, for better or worse, it is sort of the moment where a lot of these civil rights organizations still have something to do. For example, um, some of I know some folk, folks at the leadership of the Urban League, for example, I grew up with, etc. Um, this is a part of their sort of legacy. It's as if they think that this is this is the banner that they have to pick up now because that's what the young people want. But the leadership isn't there to push back and say this is not right. Um, it's been co-opted. Um, the elders know that's why, you know, you have Ben Jealous who picked up uh, the NAACP when he was um, brought on as as the leader of NAACP. People knew that he was a progressive. So again, like there has been this pushback of moderates and conservative black leadership, for example, um, and membership their option now is just to not be a part of the conversation um, because it's so extreme. But of course, the average white American, for example, or you know, conservative, for example, they don't know that there's been a 
grappling of the group for over, I would say, 20 years now. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with uh, Black leadership or whatever, um, the civil rights movement. This is not the civil rights movement. And we people don't understand that we're being used. It, it's, it's, really, it's really disheartening. Yeah, I mean, it, just my general feeling is that I don't, I don't think a lot of people understand how badly damaged the civil rights movement has been because of this left-wing progressivism that mm -hmm. has been taking over. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, unfortunately, there's too much judgment on the color of our skin that people that they, they see a black person that's going to take over the NAACP or whatever, and they think that's fine. That's another person who's got the same skin color as I do, and they, they think like I do, but they don't understand the ideas behind that mm -hmm. uh, and what that person is, is likely to do. But, you know, we have spent whether or not you're, I don't care what color you are, we have spent far too much time just being ingrained in, in a certain culture that this is the way we think, this is the way we vote, sure. you know, and that's the way we're supposed to do and not, you know, too many people have been kind of like, you don't, you have, this is the way you have to do things and don't even think about doing anything else but, sure. right? Well, because you ain't black, right? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Or put, where's my hot sauce? Like, uh, <laughs> stop it. And I'm going to send you some chicken wings and watermelon after the show or something. Oh, I mean, this word. is absolutely insane. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. But again, where where's the strength in the individual citizen? Um, literally that, again, going back to the power of your vote. Um, that's the reason why most black folks don't want mail-in ballots. I mean, if you ask them and gave them their opportunity they might have an opportunity, but they want to know that their one vote is counted. So they'll either wait in line or they'll walk themselves or drive themselves to the drop box at the voting location. That's what happened real time during the primaries, um, regardless of party. Um, this next, whatever, two and a half months are going to be, like the president said, the most important election in American history. What is the average citizen going to do? How is their voice and vote going to be counted? It, it, this is real. Yeah, look, I mean, if I were if I were one of these minorities and, and concerned about the the mail and you know voting process. This is the year I'd definitely be much more concerned about because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of political nonsense going on about the postal service and what is and what isn't happening, mm -hmm. but the uneven, uh, you know, rules, uh, you know, state by state, just in the jurisdictions about what constitutes a valid mail-in, you know, absentee ballot, mm -hmm. also lends a lot of issues as terms of people may think they've cast a valid ballot, mm -hmm. but they may have turned it in too late, or whatever, you know, lots of other issues and. And who knows how much stuff gets stuck behind whatever. So yeah, if you if you get to at least a, a ballot box, which we hope to be secure, or you go to the poll, you go you get to the board of elections, or you go to the voting place. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what the voter turnout will be on election day. Given that we're going to have a lot of mail-in voting, we're going to have a lot of early voting, and all of this, and what that turns, you know, how that really winds up doing things. But uh, I just, I have severe doubts that we're really going to know the results of the presidential election by midnight on November 3rd. Uh, no, and we're not. Yeah. And I don't know who's going to be able to call when that end time is. Again, Bush v. Gore, let's talk about it. 2000 was another year where, you know, the Supreme Court, which is not supposed to have a political question, they decided. And thank goodness, sadly, she's not around anymore. But Justice O'Connor literally made that decision. She was a conservative. Do you know what I mean? Like we're, it's no, there's no winning when you bring it outside of the, you know, the constitutional, um, you know, checks and balances that the founders, as we know as conservatives, put in place on purpose. All right, last thing before we close off here, uh, just because you mentioned it early on there about the NBA not playing here. That, that became, you know, that's become the big thing. It's like, okay, so so we, we've watched sports personnel. We, we've gone back to the, you know, we started with Colin Kaepernick and kneeling for the national anthem, creating quite a kerfuffle in the NFL. That seems, you know, that's, that kind of worked its way through. It's kind of died down in essence. Uh, but now, you know, this year in, in the NBA bubble, 
They've had Black Lives Matter painted on the court down in Orlando, and the NBA players can wear whatever kind of T-shirt message they want on their shirts. Uh, and they've, you know, they've allowed that you First Amendment right, whatever. I prefer the way it was before. They take your activism and make that a personal matter. And yeah. but it, now it just seems to me with that, and it's now been bleeding over to the to Major League Baseball which actually does not have a lot of black players. They have a lot of Latin players. They have a lot of white players, but that's not, you know, and then it's also gone into NHL and hockey, which also does not have a lot of black players. Uh, and they've all been postponing games and, and things like this. You know, I'm basically saying I'm about ready to throw my hands up on, on sports, watching professional sports at, for the most part. I think last, all I got left now is maybe golf and NASCAR. And, and tennis, don't forget tennis, about tennis. Tennis, yeah, tennis. So we've got that. But I mean, this is, I don't watch sports for political activism, you know, right. WNBA, NBA, none of that. I want to watch sports. I want to watch, you know, college football right now and college sports will seem, seems to be still kind of untouched, but right. you know, I just, I, I see this as a kind of a domino steamroller effect right. that, that sports is going to get infected with this. And I don't know what's happening, but I don't know if this is the right place for it. I don't think this is the proper place. Right. So there are a lot of layers to it. There's, um, again, Instagram, you know, celebrity culture, right? Um, one of the um, uh, Fox folks were saying that, um, are you a sports fan or are you a, play a particular fan of a particular player? If you're a particular fan of a particular player, you like this. If you're a sports fan, you hate it, right? Um, those individuals, most of them, if not, are all men. Most of them are fathers. I think that they have been they might have a personal understanding and appreciation for it. There also is pressure in order for them to take this very, um, what, what we know is radical, but what they feel is community-based stand. Um, I feel that they are sort of in between a rock and a hard place. And if the people aren't very much pro the movement, they have to be a part of the movement in order to be again accepted into the group. Um, it's brainwashing to the, to the worst degree, um, but also again, utilizing our black male leadership in order to infiltrate the youth. Um, it's communism, but you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, I was gonna say that, but, um, um, but people who are participant of it, most of them are not aware. Um, so again, they ruined sports really, because again, like you don't have, you don't have people coming to the games. All they had was to watch it and now they don't have their release. So it's a vicious cycle. It's like, you know, they, where can people take a, t a moment to take several steps back and calm down? Like no one seems to want to appreciate the bigger picture. Um, and, and it's going to be really challenging and for it to hit, it did hit NASCAR. Don't forget. Remember the, 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 um, the hang knot. Yeah. Remember? Oh so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll see if golf really um, has an impact. Well, that's when stuff's going to hit the fan. Yeah. You know, and, and, and as you said, <laughs> with, with, I think the I think the thing that made the difference this time around too versus the NFL situation or anything else is that no fans in the stands means that they don't they don't get the immediate right. feedback and blowback. I mean, yeah. so people are watching on television or streaming these games and whatnot. But but I think that sports has hurt themselves that when we do get to a point when we can safely have fans back in the stands. I don't I think there, there's going to be a segment here that's been totally turned off by this political activism that as much as they love sports, they're not coming back. Yeah, I remember the la last time I went to a Redskins game. Oh, wait, a Washington, Washington football, football game. Team. <laughs> Washington football team game. Uh, oh, whatever. Um, was against the Raiders. I don't know which year it was, but it was one of the first um, kneel during the, um, the Anthem games. And I was sitting in like the cheaper seats, right? So, so it was like the fan side and there were a bunch of Raiders fans around me. And, you know, these guys, most of them guys spent what 70 bucks plus concessions on this experience to come and you know support their teams they're like we can't do this anymore some of them would take their um jerseys and turn them inside out they're like we didn't come for here for this these guys 
they're all guys playing football now. Um, you're, you're sort of doing it for the fans. Like it's, it's, it's a really sort of difficult dance because it's your job, it's your profession, it's your life, it's your expression, but who, who, what about the fan base? Um, and I mean the fan base across the board. Not everybody is coming from the BLM lens. That's why I think there is the concept of manipulation um, utilizing, quite frankly, some of our top leaders in our community. It's, it's really hard to watch. Yeah. All right. I think we've reached the end of our time here. Thank you once again, Liz, for joining me. Never know where, never know, never know which state, city, or locality you'll be in, but that always yeah. keeps it keeps it hopping and interesting. Yeah, right. Th th thanks for all your insight. It's always great because there's so much going on here. So we'll do this again. I'll contact you, and we'll figure out another day and time. And right. for everyone out there, please stay safe, stay well. Remember, we live in the 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 the. the greatest country in the world. Do not let anybody tell you otherwise, particularly the liberal media and those Democrats and those, those Democrat socialists, right? <laughs> the progressives. <laughs> and uh, God bless America. And we will see you again. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend, everybody. And we're done. Thank you, Liz. As it's still recording. Why is this? Well, at least it's not streaming anymore, but it is recording. <laughs> I'm not sure what it's doing. I'm going to end this and then see what happens. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks.